Welcome to the YouTube channel of Kimpton Park Baptist de Kerk. We're in Matthew chapter 18 this evening, and we're continuing our series on personal problems. And tonight we're going to look at wilderness and temptation. Matthew 18, verse 7 to 9. Wilderness and temptation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we draw near to the throne of grace. You said that you will give what we need. You will give the grace we need. You'll give us mercy. You said that whatever we ask in your name, we will receive in the name of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus himself would have prayed and is praying that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So I pray in the name of our Saviour that you would grant us our request and give us to grow spiritually and to avoid temptation and to flee temptation, flee from it and to flee from worldliness and to be otherworldly, to live as citizens of your kingdom and to glorify your name. Amen. My, my brother-in-law and my sister, about eight years ago, they attended a Baptist church in Seattle in the United States. And at this church, there was a transgender man sitting in front of them. And it's like totally accept, acceptable, a cross-dresser also. And um, the woman preacher did not at all, in her whole so-called sermon, didn't give credit to God, but just spoke about how wonderful the people in the church are and that the people in the church, they the reason things are so wonderful. Absolutely no credit given to God. And you know, you, you kind of wonder what makes, what, what causes a church to go that far? What causes a church to go that far, to succumb to the temptation of the world, to become worldly, to become like the world? And how can we avoid this temptation? How can we avoid the trap that we will not succumb to the same kinds of temptation? And that's what we find here. Matthew 18, verse 7. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it's necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame and with two hands or two feet to be thrown in the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So we are going to answer two questions this evening. First question, where does temptation come from? And the answer, first of all, is the devil. The devil... And by that, I, I'm using it generically referring to all demons, Satan and demons. In 2006, a student called Ferdi Mulder was, um, there was a disciplinary hearing against him at the University of Pretoria by the theological faculty because he had accused some of his lecturers of proclaiming false teaching, liberals. One of the lecturers, Julian Miller, he denied the existence of a personal being called Satan. And even where I studied, and where I did my theological studies, believe it or not, at a Baptist seminary in South Africa, one of the lecturers denied the existence of Satan. And that's how he taught it to the third year students, at least when they were still second years. <coughs> well, according to Scripture, there exists such a being as Satan and demons. They were good angels once, and they rebelled against God, like Second Peter teaches us in chapter 2, verse 4, angels who sinned, or 1 Timothy 3, verse 6, speaking of Satan, he became proud and he was condemned, or Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, speaking of human kings, but really behind them, there are evil spirits, and one of them is Satan, who exalted himself and said, I will be like the Most High, and he was punished, he was cast out of heaven. So, so, demons were holy angels, they're now fallen angels, they are evil spirits. Like we read in, in Luke 8, where 
seven demons was cast out of Mary Magdalene. Uh, these evil spirits or evil spirits we read of in Ephesians 6 verse 12. And they hate God. They are pure evil. And they tempt human beings. They tempt people to rebel against God. Like Satan tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Or in Ephesians 2, the whole world who walks after the evil one, who follows the evil one, the prince of the power of the air. And so what these demons do in tempting us is they sugarcoat sin. They sugarcoat sin and tempt us by saying things like, I got this from a book of John Flavel, uh, by saying things like, no one will know. And this will be to your advantage. It will be fun. It's not that bad. And you can always ask forgiveness again. Other Christians have done it, even committed and devoted Christians. And in this way, Satan holds his billions. He holds billions in his power, under his power, and he leads them straight to hell, just like the Pied Piper of Hamelin, who had all these rats following him as he was playing on his flute. And so Satan does. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. So Satan is behind the world system. And then we get to the world, verse 7. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. Now we know who's behind this. But then the world themselves, the world refers here to the evil system of, made up of human beings, of people who follow their own lusts, their own passions, their own desires. And they live in rebellion against God. Jesus said in John 7 verse 7, the world hates me. They love darkness. They love evil. John 3 verse 19 and 20. And what Satan does is he uses these people, these evil people as instruments, these rebellious people as instruments, to set his traps on the path of believers. Verse 7, woe to the world for temptations. To sin the word temptations really in Greek is stumbling blocks. So Satan uses people to put stumbling blocks in our way, to tempt us to sin. And so the world tempts us through our desires and tempts us through our senses and tempts us to exalt ourselves. 1 John 2.16 the, the desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh and the pride of life. Or Ephesians 2 verse 3 speaking of the desires of the body and the mind. And the world comes and they use adverts, advertisements and social media and television and music, and uh, entertainment, and, and many other means, and they appeal to your desire for sex, and your desire for power, and self-importance, and, and riches, wealth, pleasure, acceptance, whatever. Anything they can, they'll appeal to that to try and draw you in to sin. And they want to tempt you to think like they do. Romans 12 verse 2, where Paul warns us, not to be conformed to this world. Don't be squeezed into the world's mold. Don't let the, the world allow you to be squeezed into their mold. But they try and do that. They've got a whole way of thinking about life, a different way from, from the Bible's way, a different world view. So their world view is, uh, every human is autonomous. You're the captain of your own ship. That's what Satan said to Eve. You can be like God. God is only love. God is love. He'll never send people to hell. Where we clearly read in Scripture of God condemning people to hell. In Second Thessalonians 1, for example. You know how the universe started, they will say? The universe is self-existing. It just created itself. Wait, let me just read the first verse of the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth. They'll tell you macroevolution is science. Where Genesis 1 said God created everything according to its kind. Not one species evolving into a different species. They'll tell you that man, man is just another kind of animal. Humans are just another kind of animal. Where well, Genesis 1 says we created in God's image. They'll tell you global warming and climate change is a fact. Well, Genesis 8 and the beginning of Genesis 9... It tells you at the end, end of Genesis 8 that there will always be cold and heat, summer and winter. All these seasons will always be. They'll, the world will tell you that plants and animals have the same right as humans. But Genesis 1 tells me that humans should rule over plants and animals. We should rule over creation. 
The world will tell you, your body is your own. You can do with your body as you please. So you want to be homosexual, it's your body. You want to undergo a sex change, it's your body. You want to abort your baby, it's your body. Well, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20 says it's not your body. You were bought with a price. And even if you're not a Christian, you were created by God. It's not yours. The world will tell you there's no difference between men and women. Well, the Bible says in Genesis 1, God created them male and female. There's a difference. The world will tell you you can marry whom you want to marry. You can have sex with whom you want to have sex. Well, Leviticus 18 tells you you cannot have sex with whom you want to have sex. And the Bible says you cannot marry whom you want to. God made them male and female. And for Christians, you can only marry in the Lord. The world will tell you money can make you happy. Rich people are happier than poor people. Well, Proverbs chapter 15 tells us it's better to have a house where there's love and you only eat vegetables rather than have a feast, but there's hatred. Money cannot make you happy, Ecclesiastes 5 teaches us. The world will tell you something is true and we know it's true because it was in the newspaper. We know it's true because it was on WhatsApp. We know it's true because it was on Facebook or Twitter. We know it's true because it was on the news. We know it's true because a scientist said so. That's not the measure of truth. Colossians 2 verse 8 warns you not to be deceived by worldly philosophies, empty philosophies and deceit. The world will tell you to spank your child is a kind of What shall we call it? Afrikaans kindermishandeling. It's child abuse. Well, Proverbs 23, verse 13 and 14 says it's not child abuse. You'll save the child's life. The world will tell you the Bible is only the opinion of, of humans. It's human opinions. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. It's the word of God. Second Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. They didn't speak from their own minds. They were led by the Spirit. The Bible's irrelevant for modern human beings. Not according to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17. Society determines whether something is right or wrong. No, society does not determine that. Just look at the book of Judges where society determines what is right and wrong and you have chaos. Or Romans 1. We, we determine what is sin and what is not sin by asking this question. Only if it hurts other people, then it's sin. Well, Psalm 51, against you and you only have, you alone have I sinned. You should follow your heart, the world tells you. Believe in yourself. Jeremiah tells you the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. The world tells you you must always feel good about yourself. Well, Paul said, wretched man that I am. Psalm 51, David didn't feel very good about himself. The world tells you you must forgive yourself. Well, the Bible tells you God must forgive you. Confess your sins and God will forgive you. The world tells you man is basically good. It's his circumstances that makes him bad. The Bible tells you man is basically evil. He's born with a sinful nature. Psalm 51. The world tells you all religions are equal. All religions lead to heaven. Jesus tells us he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. The world tells you your outward appearance is just as important as your inward character. Proverbs tells us charm is deceitful, charm is deceptive, beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord must be, uh, should be praised. The world tells you if you're 21 years old, once you've reached the age of, age of 21, your parents can no longer tell you what to do. There's no such thing in Scripture. A woman who wants to get married needs the permission of her father. Her father gives her away. And a young man who wishes to get married needs the permission of that dad to have his daughter's hand in marriage. Exodus 23 speaks that way. About a young man sleeping with a woman, they're not married, and then it says... He must take her as his wife. And then it says, if the father refuses to give his daughter to that man. And in the New Testament, the same. They marry and are given in marriage. 
The world tells you your sin is not your fault, it's your parents' fault. It's someone else's fault. That's exactly what Adam and Eve said. It's not me, it's the woman. It's not me, it's the snake. It's not me, it's you, Lord. You gave me this wife. The world tells you your hormones and some psychological problem can cause you to do things that you're not responsible for. The Bible says we're responsible before God. Every man will give an account of himself to God, Romans 14. The world tells you God will accept you if you do your best. God will accept you if you are sincere. The Bible tells you through human works, through the keeping of the law, no man shall be justified in his sight, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The world tells you you deserve better. The Bible tells us we deserve hell. We deserve nothing. We deserve God's judgment, Romans 1, verse 32. The world will tell you, you can sin without there being any consequences. You'll get away with it. The Bible says, your sin will find you out. What you sow, you will reap. The world will tell you, you can get divorced if you've got a difficult spouse. You can get divorced if you're no longer compatible. The Bible tells you, what God has joined together, let no man separate. If anyone divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality and married another, he commits adultery. The world will tell you it is an equal choice for married couples whether they want a dog or whether they want a child. Genesis 1 tells us be fruitful and multiply. The world will tell you every teenager is going to go through a phase of rebellion. The Bible tells me that there were young people and even teenagers like Daniel and his friends, like Jeremiah who was a young man, like young Timothy in Acts chapter 16, who were devoted followers of God. And what happens if you don't, if you don't share the sentiment of the world, if you don't share their world view, then they will hate you. Society will hate you. Jesus said so. The world will hate you. John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. But if you go with the flow, if you go with the world, you follow the stream, follow the flow of the world, well, on the other hand, then the Bible says you make yourself an enemy of God and his love is not in you. So you have to make a choice. Who do you want as your enemy? Who do you want as your friend? You want the world as your friend and God as your enemy or the other way around? So that's the world in verse 7. And then... Another cause for temptation, a third one, is the flesh. So we've had the devil, the world, and now the flesh. The word school can mean different things. It can refer to the building, I'm going to the school. It can refer to the learners, the pupils. Oh, the school comes out at one. Uh, it can even refer to the action of teaching pupils, or pupils receiving instruction, in Afrikaans at least. You can speak of Akhan school, of Akho school. So you are being taught, you're receiving instruction. And in the same way, the word flesh in the Bible can mean different things. It can refer to life, so all, all living things. God destroyed all flesh in the days of Noah. It can refer to meat, like the high priests who ate the flesh of the animals, <coughs> it can refer to a human being. The word became flesh, so he became a human. It can refer to your body. So someone who sleeps with a prostitute becomes one flesh with her, one body, because, and then he quotes Genesis, the two shall become one flesh, or Jesus in the flesh of his body that was crucified. And it can refer to the sinful nature, the sinful desires, like in Romans 8, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God. And usually to know which one it means, just look at the context. Just read the passage and you'll know, oh, this is what it means. Now in this, in this uh, sermon this evening, when I speak of the flesh, I'm referring to the sinful nature of human beings, the sinful desire of humans. And what Satan does, Satan and the world, they come and they tempt us from the outside, verse 7. From without they tempt us. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. And end of verse 7, woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. But what they do is they encourage the sinful desires inside. 
And so temptation comes from the outside, but also from the inside. From without and from within. James 1 verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then if we do succumb to the temptation and we do sin, well then the way we do it is through our bodies. By your hands, with your feet, with your eyes or whatever. Verse 8a. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin. Verse 9. If your eye causes you to sin. And so therefore it's, not, it's simply not enough. It's not enough to just say no to the deed. For instance, let's take an example of adultery. The deed of adultery. It's not enough. We must say no to the desire for adultery. Jesus taught us that. Uh, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so we shouldn't even think of that person. We should not fill our minds with in, in daydreaming about that person and having adulterous thoughts. We'd rather fill our minds and our hearts with Scripture, with Scripture references even referring to overcoming adultery or purity. Thank the Lord for your singleness. Thank the Lord that you have a marriage partner. You have a spouse. You don't need that other person. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is we need to fight sin at the level of our desires. And not just at the level of sinful words and sinful deeds. So if the fountain of the, the heart is clean, then the streams issuing from this fountain, the streams of our words, the streams of our deeds will also be clean. So we need a pure heart. We need a new heart. We need a clean heart through Jesus and through the Spirit, through regeneration, the new birth, through forgiveness of sins. The heart of stone needs to be removed. And we must receive a heart of flesh. <coughs> By the Spirit, we are cleansed. We are washed. The washing of the Spirit in the bath of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit. Being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And then we give our bodies. Then we give our senses. Then we give every member of our body to be obedient to Jesus. And to bow to Jesus as Lord and to follow Him. How can you conquer temptation? That's the second question. So now, what we just looked at now was... Where does it come from? And we said the world, the flesh, and the devil. And now number two, how can you overcome temptation or conquer temptation? First of all, expect it. <coughs> the very first Labrador we had, and we had many as I was growing up as a child, uh, the very first Labrador, big black Labrador called Gotcha. And my dad loved taking the dog for walks, and when the dog was about a year old, a Ridgeback Cross boxer uh, attacked my Labrador, our Labrador, and bit him in the face. And our dog didn't say boo or ba. <laughs> he was really, the wind was taken out of his sails. He was so taken aback, he, he didn't know that other dogs bite. <laughs> we shouldn't be like that Labrador. We should expect temptation. Jesus said in verse 7, Woe to the world for temptations, for it is necessary that temptations come. That's going to happen. It's a given. How can there not be temptation if there's an evil spirit called Satan and evil spirits called demons? How can there not be temptation if, evil, if, if demons are evil and if the world, are, the world is influenced by them? So you must expect there's going to be temptation. So we can't be laid back. We can't be laid back and just... You know, oh, there's not going to be such a thing and you're so self-confident and overconfident you think it won't happen or at least you think it won't happen with me and I'm strong and I won't succumb to temptation. If you're overconfident, you're going to fall. You're going to be like Peter. I'll never deny you, Lord, and he did. Paul tells us, he warns us, those who think they stand must be careful and must watch that they do not fall. But on the other hand, if you do expect temptation, you can, and you will probably, I hope, then you'll prepare yourself for it. 
You'll get your weapons ready. You'll memorize Bible verses, especially in the areas where you are tempted. And then when the temptation comes, you'll be able to say, it is written, it is written, it is written, like Jesus did. And you'll, you'll learn to pray against temptation and do it daily, like Jesus taught us. That we should pray, lead us not into temptation. Or Jesus told the disciples, pray that you may not be tempted. Jesus prayed that we would not fall into the trap of temptation, that we'd be delivered from the evil one. All right, so, so that's the first way to deal with it, is expected. Secondly, know that God is sovereign over temptation. John Bunyan wrote a book called The Holy War, and in this book he describes, it's really an, an allegory, a description, you know, spiritualizing uh, different things in life and making a story. So he speaks of the city called Mansoul. You can hear what it means. It's man's soul. Uh, it's called Mansoul, and then, to make a long story short, there's a very evil character called Diabolus. He wants the city, and he does get the city, and he infiltrates the city, and takes over the city. But then Prince Emmanuel comes, and he rescues the city, and he conquers Diabolus and his evil cohorts. But then Prince Emmanuel, although he conquers Diabolus and his army, he does allow some of the Diabolians, the followers of Diabolus, to remain within the city. They hide in the city. Some of them are killed, but some of them still hide. And the reason he does it, he tells the people of the town, of the city, the reason I left some of these followers of Diabolus is so that you will be watchful, so that you, so that you will never forget how bad it was under the rule of Diabolus when he ruled the city, so that you won't be tempted to turn back to him, so that you will be driven to my father to ask for help, so that you will learn warfare, how to make war, and to keep you humble. And you know John Bunyan, I think that's excellent. John Bunyan really hits the nail on the head. He gets it. Although God does not tempt us, like James 1 tells us, we must understand God is sovereign over our temptation, like Prince Emmanuel. He's sovereign over our temptation. Temptation must come. Verse 7. And it's part of God's decree. It's part of God's rule. It's under God's sovereignty. So it's not God tempting us, but he allows Satan to tempt us and demons and the world and the flesh. And why does he allow it? For the reasons John Bunyan gave. To keep us humble and to remind us you need God's help to overcome this. And so that you can grow spiritually. Like Jesus said, Simon, Simon, in Luke 22, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you. He wants to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, in other words, when you have repented, strengthen your brothers. Or the Apostle Paul, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me, to beat me up. And I prayed to the Lord, take this away, take it away, the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul boasts all the more in his weaknesses, because when he's weak, then he's strong. So God, God reminds him, you're dependent upon me, Paul. And I'm leaving this temptation in your life, this thing in your life, whatever it was, to make you look to me, to humble you. And what God also does when he allows temptation is he separates the wheat from the chaff to show us who's really on the Lord's side. Like in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 19. There's division in the Corinthian church to show, so it can become clear, who's genuine, who are really the believers and who's not a believer. And then also, sometimes God sends temptation. He doesn't cause temptation, but he allows Satan to tempt in order to punish people because they will not believe in him. We find such an example in, in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. Verse, uh, actually, it's chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God allows that, like in, in First Kings, where God allows the evil spirit to tempt the prophets and they tell lies to King Ahab so that he will die in, in the battle because he is so wicked. 
All right, so, so because temptation then is necessary, according to verse 7, because it's necessary, you and I cannot prevent temptation from happening. You cannot stop temptation from happening. So even if you go and live somewhere in the desert, in the wilderness, in a cave, or you become like a monk, you cannot avoid temptation. Satan will tempt you there. Your own heart will tempt you there. But, but, although we cannot prevent temptation from coming, we can overcome temptation with the Lord's help. God is faithful. will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. And with the temptation, it will provide the way of escape. That's in 1 Corinthians 10. Or in Titus chapter 2, verse 12, Paul writes these words to young Titus. And he says, it speaks of God's grace in verse 11, and this grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. It is possible by God's grace to overcome temptation. And then also to answer the question, how to overcome it. Uh, thirdly, take drastic steps against temptation. There was a guy in the early church, one of the church fathers called uh, Origen, and he emasculated himself. He emasculated himself, saying, mm, I'm not a man anymore. Not thinking that he's not male, but... Uh, he was afraid of being tempted and he also uh, wrongly interpreted Matthew 19 verse 12, speaking of eunuchs, some make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God and he thought that means I need to emasculate myself, um, unman myself, if I can put it that way. Well, that's definitely not what Jesus means in verse 8 and 9. Cut off your hand, cut off your foot, gouge out your eye, tear out your eye, um, or emasculate yourself so that you won't be tempted, because you can still sin, even if you don't have hands and feet and eyes um, or male parts, you can still sin. You can still sin in your desires, you can sin in your thoughts. Uh, what Jesus meant in this passage is take drastic steps against temptation and sin. Don't put yourself in a position where you will be able to sin. Make it hard for yourself to sin. Romans 14 verse 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its lusts or desires. So avoid people, avoid places, avoid, avoid anything that will lead you into temptation. Even if those things are precious to you, valuable to you. Even if it means you cannot have a smartphone because you are tempted by it. You must not be engaged to that person or get married to her or to him. Break off the engagement. Those guys there, those girls there must not be your friends because they tempt you to sin. You must not have DSTV. You must not have alcohol in your fridge. You must not have a gym contract or be part of that sports team. So anything and everything that will lead you into temptation, get rid of it. Cut off that hand. Pluck out that eye. Cut off that foot. Make it difficult for yourself. So that you do not get tempted. And then also ask someone to hold you accountable. Like Randy Alcorn, he says he was strongly tempted to sexual sin one evening. And he called a friend and said, listen, I'm very strongly tempted to sexual sin. Please pray for me. And please ask me tomorrow what I did. And he said, he didn't want to tell his friend the next day. You know, after I spoke to you, I did it anyway. Yes, so ask someone to hold you accountable. Now, perhaps you say, you know, if I do all these things you tell me, it's just going to cost too much. It's going to cost too much, not money-wise, but, but sacrifice. It's going to cost too much, and that's too radical, and people are going to look at me and think I'm weird. And, and if I follow the, these principles, well, then what can I do? No more fun. I'm going to be really be a nun or a monk. No more fun in life. Listen, the Christian life is not a picnic. It's a war. And yet in the same breath I want to say that even though you do sacrifice some, it's really not a sacrifice at all if you look at the reward. So what, you're giving up 500 rand so you can get the whole world? What kind of sacrifice is that? It's no sacrifice at all. 
Oh, so you're trading your five cents and you become a billionaire? Is that sacrifice? No, it's not. Oh, so you're trading sin for eternal life? Is that sacrifice? And then finally, think of what will happen if you give in to the temptation. That's another way to overcome it. So sometimes you, uh, um, parents, parents use warnings and parents use threats even to warn their children. Sometimes they use fear to warn their children. If you go to that fence, that dog will bite you. Don't go there. If you touch that fence, you will shock. Don't touch that. So they use fear to warn their children. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He uses hell to warn us against temptation and sin. He says in verse 7, Woe to the world. Verse 7 at the end, Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. <coughs> Even in verse 6, it's better than a millstone that a, that a millstone is fastened around your neck. You'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 8, he, end of the verse, you will be thrown in the eternal fire. Verse 9 at the end, you will be thrown in the hell of fire. If you succumb to the temptation, if you are a cause of temptation, you cause other people to be tempted. So if I can just for a moment apply this to teenagers, to young people. If you tempt boys or young men by wearing immodest clothing, short skirts and low blouses, and tight clothes or very alluring swimwear. Jesus says, you will be thrown in the hell of fire. It's better for you to drown in the depths of the sea, to be drowned alive, than to tempt others. Or for you boys, young men, promising this girl the moon and the stars if she will sleep with you, promising her you really love her, but you don't. You don't. You love yourself. You love sex. You love your own passions and desires. If you tempt, you will be thrown in hell. This is not a joke. This is not mere empty threats. This is real. Or if you tempt your friends to be disobedient to their parents, very big judgment will come. Very great punishment will come. Jesus says so. You'll be thrown into the eternal fire. You'll be thrown into the hell of fire. So you must flee temptation. It is better for you to go to heaven and you have no boyfriend, no girlfriend, you have no friends rather than go to hell. But you have friends and a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Jesus said it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two eyes. And perhaps you're not afraid of hell. Because I don't believe in hell, you say. You can say that all you want. You cannot wish away hell. Jesus said it's real in verse 8 and verse 9. Are you, are you willing to say Jesus is a liar? Do you know better than Jesus? Or perhaps you say, yes, I do believe in hell, but I'm not afraid of hell. The only reason someone would say that is because they don't understand hell. Hell is an eternal fire. Jesus calls it that in the end of verse 8. It's an eternal fire. It's a place of eternal punishment, of eternal torment. In Matthew 25 verse 30, it speaks of the outer darkness and it speaks of people weeping and gnashing their teeth. In Revelation 14 verse 10 and 11, hell is referred to as the place where they will be tormented forever. The smoke of their punishment rises forever and ever. Day and night they have no rest. You think in this world, we have all the effects of the fall. All the effects of a Genesis 3 world. Well, think of it in hell. Think of it in hell where it will be forever. Not only sin, but all the effects of sin. All the effects of the fall. Forever there will be cancer in hell and COVID-19 and asthma and migraines and toothache and kidney stones and gout and infection and depression and tears and anxiety and fear and hatred and loneliness and a guilty conscience and demons. And the worst of all is, Jesus says in verse 8 at the end, it is eternal. It is eternal. 
Mark 9 verse 48, the same. Their worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. Hell is as eternal as heaven. Matthew 25 verse 46. Eternal fire, eternal life. It's contrasted. The one is eternal, so is the other. Thomas Watson the Puritan said, Eternity is a sea without bottom and banks. After millions of years, the damned must be ever burning but never consuming, always dying but never dead. They shall seek death but not find it. As long as God is eternal, he lives to be avenged upon the wicked. If you're in prison in this world, well, you have hope. You have hope if you think to yourself and say to yourself, only four more years and my sentence is complete and I can be free, I can... I can Go come out of prison. But what kind of despair must it be to know I am never getting out of this? There is no escape ever. Now you might think you hear this and you say, but why? Why an eternal punishment? If let's say someone only sinned for eighty years, why an eternal punishment? Well, it's, it's not only what you do, it's against whom you do it. The value of the person against whom you sin. So, for instance, if you're a kid at school and you break the school rules, well, you get a, you get a demerit. But if you break the laws of the land, you can go to prison. If you break a king's law, you get the death penalty. If you sin against the eternal God, the punishment is forever. And besides, in hell people don't stop sinning. Revelation 16 verse 10 and 11 speaks about um, the punishment in darkness and people gnawing their ton tongues in pain because of the punishment and they did not repent of their deeds or stop cursing God. Jesus speaks of an eternal sin in Mark 3.29. People keep on sinning. And as long as they keep on sinning, and as long as God is a holy God, He will keep on punishing sin. Do you take offense? Do you take offense against the Bible's teaching about hell? Do you take offense and you say God is cruel? You know what the truth is? The truth is God gives people exactly what they want. And what they want is a life without God. They tell God, we do not want you. Turn away from us. And God says, you may have your wish. So what do you expect? What do you expect of a life without God? But the absence of love. The absence of God's love and goodness and joy and peace. And even if God never created hell, even if there did not exist a place called, a place called hell, well, then, then human beings would create themselves by their own sin. Just look at Romans 1. What happens to a society if God gives them what they want? They don't want God. That's what happens. People raping one another, molesting one another, murdering one another, robbing one another, stealing from one another, violating one another, lying against each other and, and gossiping and, and horrible things, horrible things. And you have a society in absolute chaos and disarray. And then we ask the question, should we, should we lay the guilt at God's door? Should we say, oh, God is guilty for punishing such people? Or should we say that it is absolutely just for God to punish such people? And perhaps you say, yes, but I'm not like those people. I'm not as bad. Not yet. If God should give us over to ourselves, we would murder. We would rape. We would commit adultery. We would rob. We would steal. We would do things you think you're not capable of. You would do it. So only by the grace of God we're restrained. And on Judgment Day, every single unbeliever will acknowledge, I get, I'm getting exactly what I deserve. Romans 3.19, every mouth is stopped. And that person will know, hell is not a place where God sends good people, righteous people for little sins. 
Hell is a place where God punishes people because they absolutely hate their maker. They defy their God. And they want him off the throne of heaven. So let us take Jesus' teaching on hell very seriously. And do not say yes to sin. Say no to wilderness. Say no to temptation. Say no to sin. And let the Lord's question to John Bunyan echo in your and my ears. John, will you have your sins? Will you leave your sins and go to heaven or have your sins and go to hell? And you can add your own name there. Will you leave your sins and go to heaven or have your sins and go to hell? And may the Lord help us. May the Lord help us to drink from this fountain of the water of life often. To drink of the fountain of living water often and regularly. So that we are not so, not so easily tempted when the world comes and they hold out to us their muddy water, their soiled water and say, drink this. That we will be able say, to say, no, I've tasted the water of life. I do not want your filthy water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are weighty matters and Strong words. And yet, Lord, we need to hear this. This is your word. And we not only take the parts we like, but also the parts that are difficult to swallow. But we accept it as your word. Help us to obey. And to fight off the world's temptation. The temptation of our own hearts and the temptation of the devil. And to follow your truth, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.